Hey, it's Keisha here with Defending the Early Years podcast. We'll be focusing on amplifying the voices of early childhood educators, advocates, and all of those who love children. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Defending the Early Years podcast with Keisha Reed. Today, I am really excited to sit back and chat with Jesse and Christina from Angie Play. So you guys, can you tell us what is Angie Play and what is your role with that wonderful work that's happening over there? Thanks so much, Keisha, for, for having us today. Um, it's just really exciting to have this chance to have a conversation with you. I know we get a chance to do that you know, semi-regularly, mm-hmm. and we follow your work really closely, both with Defending the Early Years and at you know the Discover Early Learning Center, Discover Learning Center. We've been seeing some incredible photos lately that you've been sharing of the just the joyous play that takes place there. So I mean, kudos to you for that, but also, again, thanks for uh, making us part of this conversation with you. Um, Jesse Cofino, that's me. Um, I've been sp- spent the last like seven plus years now working really closely with early educators in Anji County, China. Um, I kind of came to it through my own knowledge of the Chinese language, Chinese culture. Um, I did, I've done a lot of work there over the last 20 plus years. Um, and as a parent, you know, um, when I started this work, Um, My wife, we were just expecting our first child, um, and now we have our second child, um, who's, you know, almost two now. Um, And so, yeah, that's, that's what, that's what brought me into this work. And that work has been about understanding how early education is done and thought about in Anji County, China, how they define and approach play, and how they make these incredible sort of interlocking ecosystems of love and joy and risk and engagement and reflection, kind of the heart of everything they do. Just these beautiful, responsive, respectful environments where children form community, where they're independent, where they have the time and space and support of loving adults to really be their best selves and to kind of be at the limit of their ability almost all of the time when they're not resting or eating when they're at school. And so, yeah, my work has been to share those ideas, those practices, um, you know, with educators around the world, bringing them to Anji County to see what's going on in the 130 early child, public early childhood programs there um, organized and, you know, kind of directed by Ms. Chung Xuechen, the founder of this Anji Play Approach. We're going to talk a little bit more about, Mm -hmm. you know, and then to share those ideas through practice, through writing with educators here and in different parts of the world. So with libraries and schools and um, researchers and parents and community-based organizations and, you know, universities and students. Um, And so it's like been piloting what this means like, uh, you know, and so that's brought me into contact with incredible people like you and incredible people like my, my colleagues, Christina, um, and so many other early educators. And Christina has been working very closely with me and Ms. Chung and, and all of our partners as well. Yeah. To, to really bring this practice to life. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm Christina and, um, yeah, I was a former early childhood teacher, um, probably for about 15 years. And then I saw Ms. Chung speak about Anji play and there was no turning back for me. I <laughs> saw what was happening in the schools in Anji China. And um, I couldn't go back to teaching in the way that I had thought of teaching before. And um, there wasn't any other schools that were doing this kind of near me. And so um, instead of being disgruntled and you know, trying to change systems that were really broken in lots of ways that I had no control over. I decided to, you know, work with the Angie Play team to do a lot of what Jesse was kind of talking about, um, bringing this to all sorts of different programs, whether it's community-based or in schools and working with teachers and parents and um, all sorts of different administrators to, you know, spread the idea of play um, and its importance to um, just the communities that we work with. And something that I was really privileged and able to do was, um, um, this is quite a few years ago now, but um, I was able to spend a month and a half in Anji Chi- China with a three-year-old's class. It was the first time they'd ever been introduced to this approach, this philosophy, many times the first time that these children had ever been in school. So this is the first experience of a school as well. And so I was able to form these really awesome relationships with those children who have now graduated. And I think 
are in their first year of primary school, which is, oh, so crazy to think about, but I was able to follow them for the time they're at the school, really build relationships with their parents, with their teachers and other educators at the schools. And so it's been a really amazing experience to be able to share this with, you know, a lot of like-minded individuals like you, Keisha, who really see the value in play, you know, having conversations with people that might not see eye to eye with us, but, you know, just coming back to this idea that play is so important to the children of the world, really. And so <laughs> how can we, you know, spread this message and how can we spread the message that Ms. Chung's trying to spread um, in an authentic way that, you know, really honors the great work that's happening in Anji China too. And I just want to back up for a second as well and, and, and kind of highlight some things that Christina is bringing up. Um, it just sort of in this idea of Ms. Chung's work, what's happening in Anji County, what's happening in those schools, what's happening for those children. Um, and because I think that one of the really, I think the incredible privilege that we've had um, in sharing something that's really new, uh, but is very reflective of like, you know, the, the values that we, I think we, when we're speaking the same language, right, that we're all kind of after, like love, respect, mm -hmm. safety, freedom, um, you know, reflection is something that's, that's big for us. Um, but that we have begun to impact the conversation that's happening around early education. And we know there's a lot of people that are somewhat aware of Anji Play that have heard about it. But to kind of back up a little bit and say that like so much of our work is about how we're defining play and then what is the adult's role in relation to play. And that actually is a really kind of, it's an end to this story of like what Anji Play is and how it came to, to be like what it is we're talking about, what it is we're, we're gonna share with you about today and, and that we've been thinking about and what it means for us and what it means for people over here, like outside of Anji County. Um, and so I think, you know, part of that is Ms. Chung's role, her work, her background, her, um, her leadership. And so to just give you a little sense of who she is, um, she was born in Anji County, um, you know, um, I think in the, in, the, in the early mid sixties, so I think she's she's in her in what she's in her mid late fifties now. Um, I'd have to look at her. I have, I have her passport because I'm helping arrange travel for her all the time, and I should know her birthday. Um, and yeah, so that's that's a lapse on my part. Um, but you know, she grew up in Anji County. Um, you know, she attended local public schools. Um, at that point, um, you know, there was no expectation that she go to college or that she necessarily complete high school. She had a really big interest in um, singing, like being a performer. And that's what she wanted to do. But she was very smart and she's hardworking. And, you know, um, she was kind of pulled aside and said, you know, you can apply for a position to become an early childhood educator, be a, be a kindergarten teacher, which in China is children ages three to six. And so she went to school for that, like kind of like the like kind of trade school, like last years of high school, first year of an associate's degree. And, you know, what she receives is kind of training in basic, like taking care of children and then things like singing and dancing and like, you know, um, playing the piano and drawing and like kind of more like enriching and entertaining children. She goes back to Anji. She works, um, you know, in the 80s, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a teacher, you know, as, a, as just like, you know, an early educator with, with children. Um, she becomes sort of like a, a researcher of education at a county level. So um, she's kind of looking at like how they're doing what they're doing in their schools. And again, it all comes back to kind of like a very kind of Soviet influence on education, which again is like these activities, like culturally enriching activities that you're providing for young children. Um, and then, you know, in the late nineties, she becomes sort of the administrator in charge of like what we think of kind of as like um, a superintendent, like a superintendent of early education for the county. And um, the first thing that she's seeing is that like there's this move towards privatization to taking like the best sort of like public early childhood, like public kindergarten assets, selling them to private operators. Um, and then there's also a lot of like really gray market kind of operators who aren't well um, supervised or, or there wasn't great oversight over the early childhood that was being provided. It was marketized and it was like very low quality and just not, not great. And there were a lot of operators. And so Ms. Chung saw this and she's like, no, like, this is a public resource. And like, not only should we have like four main kindergartens in our four main urban areas in this largely rural county, but we need to like protect those that are being sold off. We need to remove them from the administration of primary schools that were like controlling their budgets, like not playing early, like not paying those teachers anything, like, you know, controlling their physical space, right? Um, and, you know, so the thing she did was like take out 
mortgages in her own name to like purchase land rights to keep schools public. She, um, you know, she made separate legal entities for the kindergartens, like with their own budgets and, and legal structure, right? Um, and then she rewrote the rules to regulate in a unified way all those private providers in such a way that they all had to leave, right? Because they all didn't meet a standard of quality that she said would be necessary to run that kind of program. This is, this is um, she has this freedom at the local level because there is that autonomy at the county level in China around a lot of educational policy, particularly for the youngest children. Um, and, you know, she was ahead of her time because she was really, you know, seeing this, this risk that was happening of like, you know, people making money off of parents' anxieties about their child's achievement, you know, at the age of zero to, yeah. know, let's say eight or whatever, right? Um, <laughs> You know, and so so she goes in and she said, this is like her biggest challenge, right? Like her biggest struggle was was that, you know, she was threatened. People are like, you know, we're going to come in and break your kneecaps basically for shutting us down because there's a lot of money that was tied up in this. But she she, you know, she took the force of her will and, you know, the fact that she was in a government position and, you know, she shifted the landscape there. Um, she also identified some interesting policy stuff that was going on around like um, urban environmental stewardship and development and like made it so that every village and town had an incentive to take a piece of land and make it a independent early childhood provider, you know, like a public kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, so she like built this network of like 130 schools in her county. So like at the end of like 2003, 2004, she's got like full coverage of like every child between the ages of three and six, 14,000 kids for her entire county. She's got, it's their staff and they have space. Um, and at the same time, you know, and I know we've seen this challenge in our work here is that like, you know, what, what is play, right? Like we were just, Christina was talking about like how we're working on play. Like we're thinking about how we're sharing Anji play. And so the reason I'm coming back to this story is like, we're going to get to this question of like how we're defining play. And that is a big question for like a lot of stuff that's happening in the United States. Like I, you, we don't need to get into like all of our thoughts about guiding children in play or, you know, play that's engineered towards specific outcomes. We can get into that. But basically 1999 or maybe 1996 and then 2001, Ministry of Education is like, oh, well, the science says that play is how children learn. And so in our new guidelines for early education, public early education, again, think ages three to six, um, play should be the central activity. Like children, that's what they should be doing all day is they should be playing. And again, like I was saying, there's autonomy at the local level to figure those things out. So 2003, 2004, Ms. Chung, you know, has built this network of schools. They've got bamboo in Anji County. This is like where the, the wire fighting scenes in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and the bamboo <laughs> were, were filmed. No, literally, that's, that's where they were filmed. Um, so she's got all these schools and she's got this policy that says they should play. They got all this bamboo and like they're making lots of like awesome toys and like mm -hmm. these like very um, enriching, you know, I, I might, one of the cognates I think of is like center-based play, you know, like all these centers with like different ways you can play and different realistic things. And like, you know, they're getting recognition. I mean, it's, she's, she's done all this work. She's built these schools. There's all these teachers. They're all enthusiastic. They've got all this bamboo, like they've got all these playscapes and they're getting, you know, they're writing about their experience and sharing about the incredible work they're doing. But Ms. Chung goes in and she's like, wait a minute, like, hold on a second. Like, why aren't, why aren't these children really happy? Like, they're not really, mm. she, she says they're not like smiling with their eyes. She's like, you know, when you ask, the, when you take a picture of them, they, they smile with their mouths and not with their eyes. And I'll tell you, I go to play-based programs where it's like, I can look at the pictures and I, you can see it, like you can use that. If the kid yep. is like, they're like on some pre-planned activity, it's like, it, it looks different than a child yeah, who's joyously engaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 it's yeah. Like, just take my picture so I can move on to uh -huh. whatever you have planned for me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so she's like, something's wrong. And then she's like, wait a minute, like all of her teachers are like super exhausted. And like the parents are super exhausted. They're like, they're making all this stuff. They're like, they're 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 struggling with the kids because they're they're encountering behaviors and the behaviors are not, I love playing with the things you've given me. <laughs> you know, they've got different behaviors and there's like different ways we label children's behavior, um, you know, generally to not think about how we are responding to or creating that behavior, yes. right? Yes. That's a whole other sort of can of worms. <laughs> um, but so, so they have this recognition. Miss Chung's like, something's wrong, right? And so she's like, well, what, like, what, what is play, right? What is play? Mm -hmm. And so she's like, well, what do I remember? And I, I've got lots and lots of stories from her youth and she played in a pretty, like she had some great play as a, as a child. Mm -hmm. Like 
in the in the hills through her village like hiding in coffins in people's attics you know like digging up <laughs> digging up jars of bones like she's got she's got to and you know uh all sorts of stuff you know like her, her grandfather chasing after you know threatening somebody with a cleaver that was her because she had put <laughs> toothpicks in a gourd as it was growing and like he gets this gourd off the vine and comes and it's like full of toothpicks so you know, um, great stories, great stories. So those are her memories of play. And she's like, well, that's not, that's not what's going on here, yeah. right? Like, that's not, that's not what's happening in the walls of these beautiful schools that we've beautified and made so beautiful for our children to, you know, to have such happy times, right? And so she starts asking the teachers the same question. She asks the principals the same question. Like, what, what do you remember as a kid? Like, what was play for you? Like, you know, we're, we're told we're supposed to do play. We didn't know telling us what play is. We're making play. People seem to think it's great, but we see there's a problem here. I see there's a problem here. And, you know, they looked at their, their, their memories and there's some pretty clear things that were, were present in like pretty much all of them. And I mean, if you're listening to this, you know, if you're just joining us now, we're talking about memories of play, but like it's something you can do too. Like, what do you remember as a child? Like your early, like, earliest, like where you have some detail about play, um, like jo joyful play. Right. Um, and, you know, first and foremost it was like a sense of freedom right freedom from anyone else's agenda freedom from like i don't have you don't have enough time like i got to go in and do something you know free spaces open-ended materials that were just taken from from like whatever was around right you know like it's not memories of you know a toy that you got on christmas that you really wanted when you were five and you played with for a year you know it's that it was that it was that broken ladder in the backyard that you took and climbed up a tree with your friend right and had a conversation up there or, or discovered an apple with a bug on it right um and you know often outside you know uh often engaged in involving like a perceived real or perceived risk of physical danger or injury right um play again over extensive periods of time and she's like well you know we have time you know, at the end of the day, we can decide what we do with our time. We have space and we have a whole bunch of kids, right? We have a bunch of children. Um, so why can't they do this? Well, <laughs> we get to the role of the adult, right? So if, 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 if what they're coming to is like, well, play is just deep and uninterrupted engagement in the pursuit of, you know, what we're interested in, right? Um, and that we structure and that, you know, that, that is initiated and structured by us and with our, with our community or peers, right? Um, you know, well, what is our role as adults? Well, the first thing we can do is just back off. Like literally she's like, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta put our hands down, you know, no reaching out to help. You gotta shut your mouth. Like no, no questions, no prompting, mm -hmm. no, no um, advice. No, no, I want to be part of your play. Right. Like I, you know, that's that, not that you can't be a part of a child's play, but no, like when you're opening your mouth, trying to communicate how you can be part of something, but then opening your eyes and ears. You know, opening your heart, really, she says, opening your eyes and ears and heart and then to discover who this child is. Right. Um, and that's what they did. So they just they just were like, OK, like, I mean, they weren't super I don't want to say they weren't super happy about it. They had they had there was a lot of doubts. I think, you know, we're talking about hundreds of teachers, dozens of principals, 14,000 children, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that's that's a change. It's, it's scary to tell um, teachers to back off and to like bite yeah. your tongue. And, you know, it's it's scary for them because their thought yeah. is then what am I going to do? You know, there goes my value. You know, that's, Absolutely. That's, that's the immediate feeling that I feel when I express that to teachers, they're like, okay, then what? And I think that's, and I think that what, you know, um, that we found in our work and that we've seen as well is that like, if you, if you have supportive administration and um, you know, the top, top down says that it's okay. Like if there's that like communication that it's safe and it's okay, what's great is that you can then confront that issue of being of the teaching things that, that the teaching thing still that, that becomes the issue rather than other things that could also become issues. Right. So they're confronting this idea of like, who am I as a teacher? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. The parents are confronting this idea of, wait, my children are doing what? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, <laughs> wait, hold on a second. Right. Like mm -hmm. they're going to, they're going to jump from things. Like they're going to get muddy. Like they're going to be in the sun. Right. Like they're not going to be, <laughs> getting basic instruction and the numbers and letters they need to succeed in life and like, you know, pass their tests when they're 18, like, you know, what's, what's going on here. Right. And so at this moment you have kind of a converge, I think you have a kind of a convergence of things. Right. Um, so you have, 
Ms. Chung, who's in a leadership position, holding the space for this to happen, right? For this larger change. Um, you have teachers that have been with her through this struggle of recognizing, respecting early education at a public level and making it high quality and available to everybody. Um, you have big spaces that she's uh, allocated and found. Um, you know, some of these schools have 500 children, some of them have two children, depends where they are within the county and what's, you know, distances. Um, and they have a whole bunch of children that are playing, right? And so it's like a joyful, meaningful experience. And, and they have the instruction to listen and, and to, 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 to see, right? So they're not disappearing from the scene. They're not mm -hmm. saying, okay, kids go play. We're gonna have a staff meeting, uh, you know, about, about whatever, right? Or we're gonna get some training in something. Um, you know, we'll have like the, the, the yard duty, you know, hang out with them and like stop <laughs> fights or whatever, right? They're there, <laughs> they're present. Like they're, they're there to see what's going on because, you know, they're searching for what their role is as the teacher. And in that process, they're seeing who children are and what they're capable of. And so now they can share that with people because it's a powerful thing. It's, it's one thing to talk about it, but to have it and to, to be able to share it um, allows for things to change. Like it allows for people to change their views on things more quickly. Um, and, you know, for the, for the first, I don't know, maybe a year or so, there's like, like there's parents and grandparents out there protesting, like praying that their child won't get hurt. Um, but, you know, one of the ways of creating a, a safe space, a responsive space for people to make that change, when you do have something that you can present them that shows its value, is to understand where they are in, the, in, the, in, their, in their understanding of something and like what their needs are. And so, you know, understanding what the true need is behind, uh, you know, a request for a particular thing to happen. So I think for Ms. Chung, she said, you know, these children, these parents want their children to be safe. They want them to learn. They don't want them to get sick, right? Um, you know, and they want them to be happy, right? And so she could then access Ministry of Education standards for child development, which are very broad. I wouldn't I don't want to say vague, but they're not, they're not super, super specific, general mm -hmm. expectations, um, general learning expectations. And she could share those with the parents and show them the play at the same time and talk about it because they had had the opportunity to see and hear that play, to be present for it. And once that started happening, once they had that permission, once they were engaged in stepping back, then they were just really excited to share what they were seeing, right? Um, so they had, this is happening in 2005, 2006, 2006, 2007, they have smartphones, right? Um, they're taking videos, they're, 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 they're going up to their teachers down the hall and be like, whoa, like, did you see what, like, you know, Billy did? Like, you know, I bet Bobby could get close, but like, I don't know, like, do you think you, like, do you think your kids could do this? Like, yeah. they were just excited, enthusiastic, and curious, and they wanted to know, they're like, oh, like, I watched it, like, we watched this, and like, no, 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 they were actually, like, making, you know, they were actually making, like, an airplane when I totally thought it was a bird, and like, mm -hmm. they weren't, like, they weren't in an argument, they were actually rehearsing something, right? And so, they were seeing a depth and complexity to allow them to like respect the children a lot more, yeah. to respond to their needs a lot better, right? To be able to, to listen and then have a conversation based on what the child has actually experienced um, and, you know, put value on it. And so those relationships started changing. The relationships started changing. There was a curiosity. And then there was this volume of, you know, uh, of, 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 of evidence, I mean, you know, of, of, of one person's um, view of an experience and then a lot of people's experiences and stories to tell about that. So then out of that grew like all these approaches to reflection and expression where children, you know, in Anji play programs in Anji County, China, every day are drawing a picture of their play. And the teacher um, is writing down what the child says is taking place in that picture. And everyday children have chances to reflect on experiences of play. And sometimes that's in large groups, sometimes that's in smaller groups, and often it's with like videos and photos and even their drawings, where they're really leading the conversation. Where again, because you know, that adult has created the conditions for this play, they've created this community with general expectations around like not hurting each other, or, you know, just, just general values, right? Of, of, of decency um, around, you know, uh, your responsibility Being a part to of others. A community. Being yeah, a your responsibility community. to others, mm -hmm. you know, and to yourself, right? Um, and so I guess there's just a lot that's grown out of that. Um, a lot of specifics uh, because this is happening. Yeah. What's so um, remarkable about it is one, um, it's been a long time, but it's been a short time to do such great work. So what's remarkable about it, about it to me is how fiercely and um, quickly she worked. Uh, another thing that's really remarkable about it is 
the power and trust um, that she commanded to make such a swift change. We are like you, you kind of touched on it a little bit in the US at a place right now where um, there could be some possible possible huge changes in our early childhood structure, huge changes that, that by all means need to take place. Um, and it's, it's prime time for something like what happened in Anji to take place here. I mean, how can we do it? <laughs> you know, like how do, how do we get this message across here? How do we use the blueprint of what's happening at Anji to make these shifts in the US. I know that you guys are working on doing that. I know you're working on some pilot programs. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the work that you're doing here in the US that is is kind of um, taking what we see working there and transplanting it um, within our, our space, our culture? Because I, I mean, children are children. No matter where you are, children are children and they all need this freedom. They all need play. They all need to be able to take risks. They all need creative expression, trust, love, all of those things. So how are we taking um, this amazing, I mean, it's a grand scale. This, it's a grand scale. And if it can work for that many children and that many different settings, then it can work here. So, so what, what is the game plan? How are we, how, how we going to change the world? <laughs> I have some ideas. I know, Christina, if you have some thoughts too. <laughs> Go for it, Jesse. You order your, you order your. I was like, I was like making some notes and I was like, kind of like, and this is just, I, I don't, don't hold me to this. I was thinking like the three S's, <laughs> the three S's, like one is kind of being specific about what it is we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's the first clear clarity and specificity. So when we're talking about play, we're talking about backing off and letting children play, but being present and responding to needs. And so that relies on the degree of knowledge of children or just like being, I don't want to say just being a decent person, but like when you respond to somebody who's communicating to you in a particular way or communicating, understanding where that comes from and like treating them as a person. And like, if you can do that really well, um, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're talking about. Right. Um, so that's like specific, like that's play, like giving children time and space and freedom. And it's not about other things that people call play. Um, and that's controversial and I'm happy to have those conversations um, in a respectful way, but you know, we have our, we, we have, you're asking us about what we're doing, right? And then, yep. and it's safe. And so I think safe, the second one um, is that it has to be safe for children, right? But children are actually fairly good at, at, I mean, depending, depending on their age and depending on the type of environment, they're pretty good about like not doing things to hurt themselves. Like they don't generally intentionally want to hurt themselves. Um, and like, they're generally not going to take generally right really inordinate risks that lead to terrible things and oftentimes unless they have had very little experience playing which is you know it's which is a reality right but really it's about the safety for the adults i mean it's about adults feeling safe doing that what i mean is like does it does a does a middle class parent in a in an urban setting in america feel safe taking their two year old to a sandbox and not asking them to share or um, you know, getting them to apologize or stopping them from throwing something, and I mean that like it doesn't like you know, and I, a safety broadly speaking, because let's say this is somebody that has all of their needs met, like there isn't a worry for them, but like they don't, they, they, I don't think they feel safe to like let their child be their child, right? And I think the same thing is true for a lot of educators, a lot of people that work with children. So how do people feel safe doing this specific thing? And then once they feel safe, they're much better at responding to like what children's actual safety needs are. Um, and children feel more relaxed and more at ease when the adult feels okay about things, right? Um, and then sharing, right? And so I think that comes back to what we were talking, like what I was kind of talking about when like, once you step, step back and you're present, right? And children are playing, there's a lot of joy and discovery and excitement and positive, like really positive feeling, like a child who's deeply engaged in discovering the world with other children in a open environment with abundant open-ended materials, like that's a pretty emotionally affecting experience to have. And so if you can be specific, create safety, and then have these experiences, then there's power in sharing that positive feeling with other people, because it will tell them that, oh, it is safe to do this. Oh, this specific thing isn't bad or like can lead to these, you know, this experience. And 
if you're creating a, a space, you know, where you're specifically stepping back, where you're trying to create safety, and that's not what's going on, if it's not joyous, then that's why you observe. That's why you're taking video and taking photos and un trying to understand and listen ch to children and, and respond to their needs. So, but then, uh, you know, specifically, I don't know if, Christina, if there's anything from our programs that you want to share or... Um, I mean, specifically... Yeah, tell us a little bit about the, the programs that you're doing in the U.S. Like, how are you guys taking the concepts and bringing that knowledge here? I would say like, I think that's something that I keep going back to in my mind is like teacher safety, because without teachers feeling safe to implement anything, like you're not gonna go anywhere. And so this is like really where on play requires an entire ecosystem in order to like make it work. So it's not just the teachers implementing it in the classroom, it's the leadership at their school giving teachers permission to be like, okay, this is what you're doing. Even if it doesn't play out exactly in the ways that, you know, they think it's going to at first. I think it's giving teachers permission to make mistakes. It's giving teachers permission to try things out, to get to know their children, to see what works for their particular classrooms. And truthfully, like if they don't have that leadership permission or you know whatever the greater school per permission is like it's really really difficult so you know we've been in lots of really wonderful reflections where teachers are seeing and hearing things deeply and they're really like creating this time and space for uh, children, but you know, if their leadership comes in and goes, well, where, where are their academic outcomes? Where blah 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 blah, it kind of like ruins it for them. Like it kind of takes away the focus. And not to say that those academic things aren't happening, but you know, how can you really get the leadership or the policymakers or the advocates to really be there to support these teachers in making that happen? Because I think that that's super critical. There's a lot of teachers that, you know, are really fantastic, um, but they can only create change within their particular classroom. And even then it's sometimes limited, right? And so unless you have this bigger systems change, then yeah, I don't know how you can do this well. And so I think the, the question is like, how do we create changes within existing school systems, existing schools so that they can really see the value of play and not just pay lip service to it. Because while well, a lot of people say, hey, like, yeah, we value play. When you go into the classroom, it's like, okay, yeah, we value play for these two hours. And then, you know, mm -hmm. for like these five, like for the rest of the time, we're gonna be doing, uh, you know, a meeting that talks about the phon phonics and letters and that. And I'm not saying don't talk about that with your children if they're not interested. Of course, that's responding to a need. Children love some of those things too. But thinking about like, how can you as an organization get on the same page and I think a lot of our work has been talking to leadership and saying hey like this is what we what we think needs to happen this is kind of what we see as being fundamental to making that shift and it's a lot of times also just seeing teachers as trustworthy respecting teachers seeing that they are professionals this field has been so deprofessionalized that you know we have things like creative curriculum where it's like okay day one week to like I, day one week two of the Apple curriculum, this is what I'm supposed to be teaching. And so it's re like reestablishing this professional environment for them too. And again, like that involves like, yeah, maybe they're not gonna do things perfectly and that's okay. Like you want them to really reflect deeply on why that didn't work or why it did really work so that it informs their later practice too. And so I think thinking about how we can make that shift um, for organizations is really, really critical. Well. And I think that this question of, which is really critical that you're talking about of reestablishing this professional environment, I think this question of like trust and autonomy for, for, for teachers, for educators, it does, I mean, the good news, I think there's some good news here, which is that um, and even thinking about things like responding to however systems define what they want, where they want children to be, right, in terms of developmental like stages, like domains of development and where a child is related relative to peer peers in like, you know, in studies. Um, but the good news is this, um, that in Anji, those teachers that were at those schools where they were creating these bamboo products and their bamboo toys and where they were getting recognition during that time, those teachers were still seen as kind of like glorified babysitters. They were still seen as like primarily being responsible for fulfilling parent wishes about children's experiences and outcomes. Um, you know, even though they had, um, you know, better work conditions, you know, they had independence and they had, you know, they had better compensation. There was still a view of the teacher that was like, you know, you're not really like, you're not really competent uh, as a professional, right? Um, and that is something that we see a lot of these standards that we deal with in the United States and other parts of the world 
Um, similarly deprofessionalized, as I think Christina is mentioning, like, you know, we can't just trust that you're going to make sure this child is happy and safe throughout these early years. Like, we have to make sure that you're capturing all this stuff so that we can decide whether or not the child is doing a good job or you're doing a good job, right? Um, what happened when they stopped worrying about those things um, and started observing was they were able to describe the things that were going on for those children that not only would have happened in a more typical scenario of development, but they were kind of like supercharged because these children had freedom in space, right? And so they were able to share like really interesting positive observations about children with parents that were able to share those experiences. And that changed the parents' view of the, the, mm -hmm. the teacher. But part of that, part of that reprofessionalization and part of the work that we're doing with the pilot programs, both like schools that are specifically implementing Anji Play or um, community organizations that are working with Anji Play, or in our work with groups of teachers that come, you know, groups of educators that come together who aren't specifically working with Anji Play or school systems that are thinking about play in their early childhood programs, is that part of the first step of reprofessionalization is protecting time for teachers to come together and reflect on their experiences, time that isn't occupied by content from other experts or lessons they're supposed to learn or things they're supposed to do or tasks that they weren't given time to complete as part of the expectation of their job. Like truly protected time, you know, I would say at least weekly and Anji for teachers, the teaching team in the classroom meets once a day and then the school meets once a week as, as, as teams. Um, and then coming back to those moments, looking at videos you've taken of play and thinking and understanding what's going on there, either for the child or for you when you're taking that video or in the environment with your materials, um, that, that that's kind of been our way is to say, you know, we can talk about a lot. We can think about ladders if you want to. We can think about children drawing, you know, pictures of their play after they play. The most important thing is that, that play is happening. The only way we're gonna know that play is happening is if you're taking a video. And the only way we can all come together and think about that play is if you're taking a video. And so, it's not like I don't want to give away our secret sauce, but like that's a lot of the work. <laughs> but the, seriously, that's a lot of the work we do. And so it 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 because it, it, it requires that you be in an environment where you can step back so that you're recording play, that you are focused and present and seeing what's going on, and then that you have something to talk about. And so I guess, yeah, along with that, something that I was thinking about too is like, and this is like, I don't know. I, I hesitate to give this advice, but like as teachers, give yourself permission to relax. And so something that I realized when I was an Angie, and this was like really like so drastic, like compared to like my like practice in like the US is, so, you know, like you said, Keisha, children are children, regardless of where they are in the world. So in the three-year-old classroom, we had children throwing things and children that wouldn't clean up and like they were writing on tables and like everything that you see in a U.S. classroom, it's like, no, I, I saw that in Anji. And like, so it's like, you know, the ch it's not that Anji has these like special children that, you know, are really well behaved and just do everything that the teachers say. Like, that's not the case at all. But something that I thought was super fascinating is like, so I come into the classroom, I'm like kind of on edge. I'm like, oh my God, like what is going on? There's all this like stuff happening. And so like every day I had a chance to like debrief with the teachers afterwards and just the way that they would talk about things or like they would um, rephrase like what I would, was talking about was so interesting to me. So for example, like there's this one little boy that just would never clean up, like just wouldn't. And I'm like, after like watching and observing for like a few weeks, I'm like, hey, what are you going to do about like about that? And they're like, what do you mean? What am I going to do about it? I'm like, well, he's not cleaning up. And they're like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, but like, what? No, no. Like, what, what are you going to do? Like, what if he just doesn't clean up? And they're like, I don't know. Like, we'll give him more time if he like doesn't do it after. I don't know. Like they had like some super long period of time and they're like, I guess like if he's not doing it, then maybe we'll talk to him about it or like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, but what if that doesn't work? And this is again, like my you like American teacher brain and they're like, I, I don't know, give him more time. Like, and, oh, but what if the time doesn't work? And then like, I just kept going further and further and they're like looking at me like, oh my gosh, like, no, like settle like, down. Like, out lady, yeah. Yeah, and so like, it was just <laughs> funny, like all sorts of these questions I'd bring up and some of them, they like wouldn't even understand what I was asking because they're just like, it's not a big deal. Like, why are you, why are you focusing on that? Or like, I would ask them about like, um, like what happens when there's conflict between you as teachers? Like if you disagree on things and they're like, 
I don't know what you mean. And they're, I'm like, you know, like if you have like, you feel one way and this other teacher feels like another way, what do you do? And they're like, we look to see what the children are doing. And like that, it always comes back to the children. She's like, we're not the important people here. Like we are here for the children. And so the children will show us what we need to do. It doesn't matter if we have different opinions. It, all that matters is like the children that are right in front of us. And so just this like idea that like nothing is so serious, like, of course, like they're going to take certain things like seriously if they're if they warrant them being serious. But a lot of the things that I learned that us as like U.S. or American teachers think are big deals in the grand scheme of things, they don't really matter. Yeah. And they just stress out the teachers. They stress out the children and everyone's on edge and nobody like really ends up feeling like this. the classroom is this joyous place because there's so much constant pressure being put on you and your expectations of these children that you can't just see who they are, like honestly. And so I think that like one of my biggest advice is like, think that like, give yourself permission to just be like, okay, this is fine. Like, yeah. unless it isn't fine. And like, you know, that I think as teachers, we kind of know, really know when it's not fine, but like, how can we also just take this pressure off of constantly having to do things, constantly having to fix children, constantly having to get them to be in a place where they're not ready to be in. And when they're ready to be there, if they're ready to be there, they'll get there. Right. And you're mm -hmm. just creating this loving environment where you guys can live together, be together and just be a community that's there and support of one another I just have never felt that at any of the schools that I've been in in the U.S. there is just this sense of community everybody looking out for each other again it's not that big a deal we'll handle it we'll figure it out it's we've got this and so just thinking about that like how can you bring that feeling into school yeah. and honestly that's what I think yeah all all humans really but especially young children need they just need an environment where they can live and be and love that's all they need they don't need um you know these crazy agenda filled structured classrooms with these crazy agenda filled structured teachers and administrators and politics and all those things they need a place where they can do what they're born to do to be creative to be you know big sometimes and loud sometimes and what scares me is that with us going possibly going to a more um universal pre-k program that that's going to be lost you know, that, that we have not in the U S uh, done a good enough job of sharing and showing, improving and explaining the importance of allowing young children to be. So I think, and um, you might have my children in the background for a moment as I, as I respond to what you're saying, because I feel like part of the good news I was talking, that I was kind of mentioning before of like, okay, if you can have, um, you know that support so that so the teachers can come together and reflect and are we're specific about creating safety and stepping back and taking videos is that you can actually answer a lot of those um a lot of those expectations right so we talk to teachers we're working with we're like oh you know whatever their observational assessment is the drdp or you know whatever it is they have to use programmatically because they're receiving federal money or state money or local money or for whatever licensing requirements they have to track children's development that when they have these long uninterrupted videos of play like they have so much more to say about all these children's abilities that are much more reflective of their abilities and then when people come in to rate them or review them and they're speaking fluently and in in an empowered way about what children are doing it's kind of hard to deny that those are good teachers. Like even those systems allow for them to be good teachers because they are meeting those needs. Like Ms. Chung is meeting those parents' needs. Like I'm gonna show you your children are learning even in play. These teachers are like, I'm gonna show you I'm an expert in what's going on for children because that's my job and I'm an expert. But part of that is resources. I think part of it comes back to resource allocation and recognition of that expertise. So you have to create the models of this happening within those systems and then share those broadly to communicate that these systems can make this possible. But part of that reprofessionalization is like, again, clarity and specificity. Like, no, like they have to be like, teachers have to be able to meet like every week for two hours with nothing else that like, compensated with nothing else going on. They have to have access to devices. They have to be able to reflect, um, you know, this has to be a priority. That's part of reprofessionalization, but, what I would say is so much money 
so much time and resources are spent on things that have like is like not zero results, but like oftentimes have negative results. Like a lot of the mm -hmm. professional development we see, a lot of the training, a lot of the books, a lot of the subscriptions, a lot of the materials that are being purchased, a lot of the support that's being given could all be done by those teachers and by their schools if they're clear about what they're doing. Yeah. Not all of it, but a lot, like a lot of that a can be done it. by them. So it's not yeah. that, that you need extra to make this happen. It's that you need to redirect those resources. So instead of spending, you know, $150,000 on a playground, that's like rubber and plastic and metal and like, seems like the greatest thing that everyone's advertising, like, how can you create open-ended materials and semi-fixed and fixed play structures, you know, within your requirements? Um, because that's a big spend, but you can also do different things with that spend. Um, I mean, yeah. but then also going back to the PD, like, I think that's something that's so powerful too, as, um, so like, we've, we've been working with teachers a lot. We, we reflect with them a lot. And like something that comes up in their reflections just on the entire process of like reflecting on videos and things. When you reflect on videos, you can talk about anything that's happening in the classroom. You can talk about anything that's happening in the school. And so what they said is like, these PDs are so meaningful. They're about us. They're about our children. It's not about the newest Play-Doh recipe and how to present Play-Doh to children. And, mm -hmm. you know, you get that handout. And then when you come back to school the next day, you're like, oh, wait, what did we talk about? Like, is this even applicable to my classroom? They're saying, you know, when you do take this approach to professional development, you get rid of a lot of those other like extra ones that do typically cost tons of money. Like it's actually more beneficial and they are, it's so useful to them in changing their perspective of teaching, changing their perspective of the children in front of them and giving them actionable things that they can do in their classroom like tomorrow that mm -hmm. respond directly back to what they are noticing that the children in their care need. And I think that that's also something to like consider too, right? Like where is this money for professional development coming from? And you know, there are some really great professional developments. I'm not gonna knock them all, but a grand majority of a lot of them that are offered to particular types of programs are not that. They're not giving teachers what they need. They're not giving them the resources um, to really create that classroom community that you were talking about. Kisha, and right? I was going to say that the idea of the um, reflecting on photos and videos and having the, that dialogue with your co-teachers or the teacher down the hall is so community building. And yeah. it, 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 it's such, um, we do that. That's what we do at my school. And what happens is you realize um, how much more you get from an observation when there's lots of eyes on it, when you're all discussing things and thinking together, you realize how much more connected you become because now I understand the lens through what she looks through. Exactly. Um, you know, it, and is it, br just... it brings that stronger community too, because yep. now you see your co-teacher as an even more perfect, like more professional mm -hmm. than they were before, because, you know, when you're just sitting in those like random PDs, it's like about Play-Doh, it's just like, okay, like, cool, we're just sitting here. But when you actually get to have that dialogue in with your co-teacher, you're like, actually, I don't really know. I don't think that's what I saw happening in play. I think it might be this. And then you have that dialogue and you watch the video again, or you look at the photos again to like really like dig into it together. That's such a like amazing experience for you two to grow as educators together, but also just to elevate each other. And I think in the early childhood field, there's so much competition for trying to get to those like prize small few like positions, whether it's like a site director or like a studio yeah. teacher or whatever, this kind of brings the classroom teachers community closer together and like, no, we're in this together. We're not like infighting and we're not, not like yeah. trying to work yeah. against yeah. each other. Like, no, we're here because we're here for the children and we really want to do what's best for them. And, you know, just I don't know. Every time I watch a video, I'm so surprised. Like I've seen lots of videos of play. I'm sure you have too, Keisha. And sometimes I'm just like, I've never seen children ever yes. use these materials in this way. Or like the way that they're interacting is just something I have never seen. And it's so interesting. And it totally questions a lot of the learning that I had done before. And it's just so amazing, like how rich these videos really are and how much you can because take the children in, in the end, honestly, the thing, the, the resource that I learned the most from are the children like my work with them every day they teach me something new so to be able to capture that and share that i i get why that is the key to making this change well and oh some God. of the well, well i mean and a lot of what christina is talking about um you know what, what we've been sharing what you're sharing is like we kind of think of as best practice like like this is just what people should be doing like, we don't have to call it on play we don't have to call it true play like just call it play or just call it reflection one of the big questions we come back to is this idea of safety, of love, 
creating space for, for educators to give children time and space. Christina is really bringing us back and really bringing us back to these like ideas of best practice, things that we see, that we, that we hope are best practice, but we don't see that much, which is just like, what is like our clear commitment to play? Um, what is our clear commitment to listening to children and to listening to each other? And then for us, there's this other specific aspect of what kind of records are we creating a play that we can come back to as professionals and think about and, and reflect on. And so I think that I know everybody learns differently. Like I know I read, read books and I really enjoy it. I, it's harder for me to learn that way. A lot of people do really love reading and theory, but for us, there's a lot of um, pulling ourselves back into what's happening in our environment right in front of us and making that the text that we're really working from, like the text of the child's experience. Um, and that shift that we're talking about means reconsidering a lot of things that we've learned or that we've accepted as, as stories about who children are or who teachers are or who groups of people are, um, challenging those assumptions by just responding to what's in front of us. And so that's, 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 a, that's gonna be the powerful part of hopefully, and I think we're doing it, changing practice within systems so that systems can change to reflect those values and those practices. Wow. This has been a wonderful dialogue and I really hope that um, educators listen to this and get empowered and inspired and come looking for you guys. So can you tell us how we can uh, get in touch with Anji Play? This is just the tip of the iceberg, Keisha. As you know, we can go oh, into yeah. so many different aspects and hopefully we'll have more time to talk to you some at, at another time, but yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think- where, 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 where should we send people? <laughs> I mean, you know, I just wanna, um, because I know we have an audience that in probably hopefully includes early educators and policymakers and people that are just interested in childhood and play and who are interested in your work. The people that are interested in your work, we really want to have come talk to us because we know we're, you know, we know that, that those are soulmates company. and people that we, you know, the people that we want to have conversations with, of course. But I think there's a lot of ways to begin to think about or learn about Angie Play. If you Google the Anji interviews, that's like 10 educators from outside of China reflecting on their firsthand experiences of being in Anji County at these schools. Um, so that's one, one avenue of, of learning more. Anjiplay.com, our website has a lot of information. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Just Google Anji Play and you'll find it. Um, Christina and I and our colleague Emma Pickering, who is the early years lead at the British International School in Budapest, um, recently collaborated on an article about relationships and practice, um, which you can find on our website and in our social media feeds. So that's like a recent article about practice that's for practitioners is a nice sort of uh, look in. And then just, yeah, Jesse at onjiplay.com is me, J-E-S-S-E. And Christina and Angie plays me. Yeah, so if, you, if you have something specific you want to say to us or feedback, you know, we and love And also we do have a lovely community. Um, it's the True Play Community Network. So it's trueplay.mn.co. Um, it's a community where we share a lot of things that are happening with Angie Play and True Play. Um, you can keep up to date on like current events or different like professional developments that we're offering through that website as well. Um, and you know, if you feel like you want to share some amazing play that's happening at your school, um, this is also a really awesome place to share that with others and hopefully, you know, continue the excitement about True Play and just um, embracing play as the way to be with young children and the experience that they should be having at school. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for coming and being a part of this podcast. I'm sure we will be talking again. Yeah. And thank you so much for your amazing work. Stay tuned, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Keisha. Keisha. Bye. Bye. And that was another episode of the Defending the Early Years podcast. Defending the Early Years works to support the rights and needs of young children nationally. Learn more at DEY.org. Pay us a visit, sign up for our newsletter, or connect with us on social media. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.